Okay, the message today has to do with church. Don't give up on America. If you watch the news, if you listen to talk radio or the news, it can be pretty discouraging. All you hear is negative, negative, negative. You would think that this is the most awful place in the world. Let me tell you, it's not. You're not getting the whole story. This is not the awfulest place in the world. Why do we... I'll tell you why we get that kind of news coverage. Because there's a little motto in the news, uh, in, in the world of reporters and publishers. It's called, if it bleeds, it leads. Ever hear that? In other words, if it's gory, if it's bloody, if some tragedy happens, that's the news. That's what people want to hear about. Well, there's some truth in that because who wants to hear on the news, we'd like to announce that all planes landed safely at SeaTac today. That's not news, right? So if something awful happens, that's news. But that's not the whole story. How many days do you go to work and just typical day? It's not newsworthy. I would say that probably 99% of your days are not newsworthy. That's good news. Isn't that good news? Absolutely. So I've given a lot of thought to this message because this is my last message here. It's also my last message as a pastor. This is my third time I've retired, so. <laughs> it, it might happen again, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, who knows? But in just a couple weeks, in just a couple weeks, this church will be selecting, electing a new pastor, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to, to know that's going to happen. In fact, he's visiting with us today. He's not officially here yet, but... Uh, Mark and Kate, would you guys stand up? Pastor Mark and Kate, his wife, and their two daughters. Uh, yeah, so glad. So glad to have you with us today. And uh, they'll be speaking the next two weeks here, and then from there on, assuming they vote you in, that's, you know, I'm putting in a good word for him, okay? I just. So, um, it does feel strange to be saying this is my last service, not only here, but probably as a pastor. But here's the reality. Life has seasons, and life goes on. You were a child once. You were a teenager. There were some exciting things and some awful things. As we go through life, life has seasons. And rather than dread the seasons of life, Believe me, when I look in the mirror, I dread the seasons coming. I just, <laughs> but, but rather than dread them, embrace them. You know, I, we, we have a good friend who uh, we visited in the hospital yesterday. We've got several good friends who are probably facing death because of illness. Life has seasons. We just met, visited with another dear friend a couple days ago. And she has a, a, a very horrible prognosis. The doctors say, mm, Two weeks to maybe two months. And unless God does a miracle. And, but you know, I'm really proud of her. She loves the Lord. She's not, I mean, she's not looking forward to dying. Obviously, that's not normal. But she's not fearful of it. I know the Lord. I love Jesus. I know where I'm going. And I'm embracing the next season of life. And Pastor Dan, would you help me plan my funeral service? Because I'd like to have a hand in that. Isn't that cool? You know, I've told you what I plan to do. I'm going to make a recording and preach my own funeral. That's what I want to do. I want it done right. And you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say, don't look at that body down there. Look up here. Don't I look good, you know? Sure look better than a corpse in a, you know. That's what I really would like to do. So this is as good as it's going to get. So what does America have to do with following Christ? Wow, that's a tough, not a tough question, it's a big question. Why do we take a whole service one week into the year to talk about uh, American patriotism and honoring our military and reflecting on our history? So these are profound questions that I fear are not being asked anywhere in America, or very few places. I did watch a wonderful message this morning on TV from a pastor who was just ringing the bell, and I loved what he had to say. First of all, America is unique in the history of nations. 
Every nation in history was organized by either political or military conquest. And the unity was around one of several things. Often it was around race, sometimes around language, sometimes around a culture, sometimes around land and territory. Sometimes uh, it was around religion. But virtually all the countries of the world were founded around those kinds of values. America is unique. Why? Because America was founded on the basis of principles. What does it mean to be an American? What color is an American? What, what, what kind of a person is an American? You know, what language? There's no clear, there's no one size fits all. America is unique. It is unique because we are formed around a set of Christian values. Before America, the world is ruled by kings. Kings lived above the law. Whatever the king said, you could do. There were no values or principles that guided, read your history. It was not a nice system. Yes, they had laws, but the king was above the law. They called it Rex Lex, the king above the law. And those who disobeyed the king were simply executed at whim, at his whatever. Nothing like America was ever thought of or done before. Number two, America is founded on Christian values. These values have created the most successful and the most wealthy country in the history of the world above any other country for the envy of the world. Tragically today, most schools do not teach this. In fact, most schools teach what is not true. History books have been rewritten. Let me say that again. History books are being rewritten to tell a story that is simply not the true story of America. And that's why I, I delight to embrace the opportunity to talk about the truth of the founding of our country. The first pilgrims who came here declared their express intent to evangelize the local population. They came as missionaries. Many other waves of people came later on, but the first ones came to share the gospel. And many of those who followed them also. Don't believe everything that you hear on TV or on the news or on the internet either, for that matter. Let me tell you up front, America was founded and created by Christians for Christians. It was not founded for any other purpose. Now, I know that not all, evangel not all the founders were evangelicals. They were not all Christians in perhaps our definition, our, our, our definition. But in fact, some of them were rascals. But they all had a Christian worldview. They understood things like justice and right and wrong. They understood the Ten Commandments. They understood Christian values. They were all very familiar with the Bible, all of them. They prayed together. Look at this. This is a painting. When they were at the Constitutional Convention, they were having trouble trying to come to agreement. Benjamin Franklin, hardly a born-again Christian, but understanding worldview, said, gentlemen, we need to pray. So they paused. Our founding fathers paused, and they prayed to Jesus Christ. And this painting was made in honor of that event. When they spoke of religious freedom, they were referring to Christian denominations. It never crossed their minds that they were talking about Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists or any of that. When they said religion, they meant Christianity. They didn't mean anything else. In fact, do you know that most of the original colonies, because there were colonies, there was no one country. Most of the original colonies had a state religion, meaning a very different denominations. For example, Connecticut was Congregationalists. Georgia was Church of England. Maryland was founded as a haven for Catholics. Massachusetts and New Hampshire, Congregational denomination was, was, was the official one. Carolina and Virginia, that official denomination was the Church of England. Pennsylvania was founded by Quakers, and on and on. I could give you a long list. Uh, most of the original states had an official denomination. 
If you don't like the way we Baptists preach, go to Maryland. It's true. You don't read that anymore. And I'm not saying they were right, but you know what? We got a new word out of all of that. One by one, as those various states began to uh, disestablish the official state religion. When I say state, I mean the, the local state. When they began to disestablish those, we got a new word in the English language. One that when I was a kid in grade school, every kid thought it was the coolest thing to be able to spell. Anybody know what that word was? Disestablishmentarianism. We all learned how to spell that. Wasn't that cool? We didn't know what it meant. But, we, but what did that mean? They were disestablishing the denominational preference of the various states. So you don't have to be a, a, a Catholic to live in Maryland. You don't have to be a Congregationalist to live in New Hampshire. You can worship God according to the dictates of your heart, which was an improvement. I will grant you that. But my point is, they were not talking about anything but Christianity. They were only talking about Jesus. In fact, in the early days, they called America a Protestant nation because Catholics were a very, very small minority and Jews even smaller. They were all culturally Protestants. doesn't mean they're all born again. I get that. Number four, America was a rejection of all previous political systems. They started from scratch. As I said, all the... All the nations had kings and uh, dynasties up to that time. Despots and tyrants ruled most of the world. And most of those people were evil men. Most of them were. But our founders prayed together, and God gave them a new concept, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That's what they prayed for. And that's what God gave us. And God has obviously blessed these endeavors. When you study our history, you will understand that this country's flag stands for Christian values. And the Bible says clearly that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And God has blessed this American experiment greatly. You see, our political forefathers were also our spiritual forefathers in, in a very significant way. They laid the foundations of what, what made this country what it is. And let me say clearly, they were Christians first. Before they were politicians, they were Christians first. They believed in liberty and in justice for all. The concept of justice was really quite radical. Oh, yeah, people said the word. But true justice was something they aspired to. And these foundations are why we must not give up on America. Our country flourished and became the greatest most successful and wealthiest nation in human history. Drive down the freeway and you're going to see construction going on. Bridges being built. You, every place you go in America, we're still under construction. We're building stuff. We've done a lot of great things. Has America done some bad things? Absolutely. I'm not saying America is perfect. We don't need to go into that today, but I'm sure, you hear it on the news all the time how terrible America is. you got enough of that. Let me tell you another side of the story. There's a lot of good in America. And the best part of America is when you look around right, here, right now in this room. This is the best part of America. Christian people who love Jesus, who worship the Lord, who serve God. This is what makes America great. People like are sitting in this room. And I'm proud to be identified with you and all other brothers and sisters in Christ who love Jesus. We're the salt of the earth. That's what Jesus said. We're the salt of the earth. I don't know if we're a majority or a minority. Probably a minority in the form of born-again Christians. But we're still a majority in America as far as people with a Christian worldview. Unfortunately, that's not what you hear in the news. But I'll tell you this. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I want to proclaim and preach that. Can America be called a Christian nation? Well, it's certainly more pluralistic and diverse than when it was in the last two centuries, in the 18th and 19th century, we're far less Christian. Although there are greater numbers of born-again Christians in our country than ever before, the percentage is shrinking. But uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of all people in America would still call themselves Christian, whatever way that you want to define it. And our Constitution is based on the Bible, not on the Koran, 
not on the Bhagavad Gita or any other religious or book. It's based on the Bible. This country's foundations were found in the Bible. In fact, think about this. We still observe every Sunday as a holiday. Why Sunday? Because that's the day Jesus rose from the grave. And that's still a tradition. Now, when I was a kid, nobody did anything on Sundays. You know, you couldn't even go to the grocery store on Sunday and gas stations were closed. You had to gas up on Saturday if you want to go someplace on Sunday because you couldn't buy gas. And then grocery stores got a little tricky. They opened the store, but you couldn't buy meat. So they would spread newspapers across the meat department. I don't know why. I guess the, the butchers had some deal going. They wanted Sunday off. But anyway, true. I mean, when I was a kid, Sunday was still a holiday. Nothing was open. Nothing. Do you remember? Every Christmas, pretty much everything still closes. Why? It's a Christian holiday. When I was a kid, we didn't have spring break. We had Easter vacation. We didn't have winter break. We had Christmas vacation. But you know what? The cool thing, those are still holidays. Those are still holidays. And the one that is a huge favorite of mine is Thanksgiving because that's a national holiday when the entire nation shuts down to do what? Give thanks to God. A holiday to go to church and pray. That is so cool. I don't understand why more churches don't do that. We did that here last Thanksgiving. Was that cool or what? That was just an amazing, amazing thing. We gathered, we thanked the Lord, we worshiped God, we thanked. Oh, it was amazing. We still have national holidays that are Christian. I think that's amazing and wonderful. We need to continue to celebrate as wonderfully as we possibly can. You know, the Ten Commandments are still on the wall behind the Supreme Court justices. Wow. Did you know on your coins and on your money, it still, it still says what? Wow. Probably not true anymore, but, but it's there. It's there. It's there. Our culture is fundamentally, at its foundations, very Christian. It's a teaching of the Bible. The whole idea of checks and balances in government. We don't want the king to have all power. So we have checks and balances. You know where they got that idea of legislative, executive, and, uh, and judicial? You know where they got that? From the Bible? Prophet, priest, and king. That's where they got the idea. Three branches. Why not four? Why not five? Why not two? Because the Bible had prophet, priest, and king. And, and I've preached a whole, whole sermons on that very topic. I won't go into that. But regardless of how desperately the world tries to rewrite American history, it's there for those who will, who will read it. It was founded by a most remarkable group of pretty much young men. At this point in my life, I would say these kids. But, you know, they were in their 30s and 40s, most of them, some in their 20s. Mostly young men who said, we want freedom. And they fought for it. And many, many of them died for it. Today, they would be called the radical right. They would. The principles they established were radical, but today we call them conservative. America is still the most envied nation in the world. People risk their lives every day to come here. If you follow the news, our southern border, that's a whole discussion. But the point I want to make is people are still desperate to get into America. These Christian principles were rooted out of the Bible, found in the Bible, and safeguards were built into our Constitution. Get this. Because they recognized the sinfulness of man, they said, we need to make sure, we need to do what we can to make sure that sin does not flourish. So our Constitution was meant to put restrictions on the government, not on the people. The Constitution was to restrict the government so we could be free. Things are changing, aren't they? But what our founders wanted was limited government, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to own guns, and a swift and just trials by a jury of peers. Things like that. Where did they get all that? Right out of the pages of the Bible. At that time, those were all very radical concepts. 
Now, again, we're not here today to say this is a perfect country. Far from it. Anybody else yell at the TV once in a while? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. A lot of things happen in our country I'm not happy with. But that's not our point. I want us to look at the big picture. We have many problems. And sin is always crouching at the door. But America is unique in the history of the civilized world. But now the crazy thing is, we used to be called a melting pot of nations. People would come here, learn the language and culture, and blend into the American culture. Today, people come here and try to bring their language, their religion, their culture with them. They seem to forget that those are the very things they left behind because they didn't like them. If you like that, stay where you are. They want to come to America and turn this into the same place that they left. I, it's hard for me to understand. The, the advance of sexual deviancy in our culture is just a stunning thing to me. God calls it sin. He also calls adultery and stealing sin. And God calls us to turn back from our sin. When is the last time you heard the word sin even mentioned in our culture? Did you ever listen to the radio or watch TV and hear the word sin? In any way. Sin. Say it. Sin. Doesn't that feel good? But you're not supposed to look at your neighbor when you say that. You know, just... Sin. There is such a thing as sin. Now, oh, goodness. I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent. But the new national virtue is sin. The Bible talks about sin crouching at the door. Sin is destructive. Sin ruins lives. Sin, sin destroys families. Sin brings people to death itself. When you indulge in things that, are, that God calls sin, not only do you hurt yourself, but you hurt those you love and hurt those you don't even know. A drunk drives down the road, and he hits somebody he doesn't even know. Everybody gets killed. Sin. Sin is real. Sin is destructive. But the new American Western virtue is tolerance. There's no such thing as sin in our culture. Well, if that's what if you think you're a uh, if you think you're a girl, but you really have you were born a boy, well, you can think whatever you want. That's fine. That's just stupid. You can think you're you know a Chinese seven foot tall midget. All you want. But that doesn't make it reality. Can we just be honest? And, wow. Look, it is no virtue to tolerate evil. And there is evil in this world. And there are many evil ideologies that would love to stamp out God's truth. And God calls upon us to be a light, a city set on a hill, both individually and as a nation. I believe that this nation was founded with some very high, lofty, noble ideals. Tolerance is not a virtue at all. Do you know what the Christian virtues are? Let's read them. Galatians 5, 22, 23. Would you read this with me out loud? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things. There is no law. Love is a virtue. Joy is a virtue. Peace is a virtue. Patience, kindness, goodness are virtues. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control are virtues. I don't see tolerance in there anywhere. Tolerance is not a virtue. Tolerance enables wickedness. The sum of it all is if we would most truly enjoy this gift of heaven, we must become a virtuous people. Wow. Samuel Adams, one of our founding fathers, said that. If we are in to enjoy the blessings of heaven, we must become a virtuous people. You can't just tolerate everything and do whatever you want. Licentiousness is not the same as liberty. Licentiousness is just doing whatever you feel like it with no consideration for the outcome. Liberty is the opportunity to do what is right. Let me say that again. True liberty is the opportunity to do what is right. Jesus did not tolerate the hypocrisy of his day. 
He spoke against sin. He spoke against evil. Again, America was created by, mostly by religious spiritual leaders. Many of the leaders of the American Revolution were Christian men, pastors, Bible school teachers. Uh, for the most part, uh, very committed Christian people. And what were they fighting for? Yes, they wanted freedom of the taxation and, and unjust taxation, all that stuff. But they really also wanted freedom that truth might prevail. They upheld truth. And why is that important? I'm all for a level playing field, but that's what I want. You know, if, if people of various cults and weird religions, let's just have a level playing field because truth will prevail. The gospel of Jesus Christ prevails over all because it's God's truth. Political correctness is flat out evil. When you must talk and think and believe like I do or else, that's flat out evil. It's an attempt to make everybody think the same about everything. Political correctness tolerates no variance. Freedom of speech is squashed when no contrary opinion is allowed. Wow. That's what you find in heathen countries. You can't talk that way. You can't think that way. You must march to the same beat, everybody. And that's why I'm so proud to be an American. I've been in 84 countries. I have lived in many of those countries. I've visited many of those countries. I've preached in probably close to 70 of those countries. I, I've seen a lot of the world. I'm getting to be an old man. I don't like that thought because I love life. But I'm getting to be old. But I've had a lot of experience, and I've seen how communism works. I've been in communist countries under the hardcore stuff back when in Eastern Europe. I've been to Cuba more than once. I have, I've walked the streets of, of Muslim countries and, and seen the horrors that take place in heathen countries. And yes, they are heathen countries. Godless. Oh, they have their own version of God. But it's not truth. I am grateful for America. I am grateful. You know, I could have chosen to live in any country that I wanted to. I didn't want to live in Cuba. I sure didn't want to live in China or Russia. I didn't even want to live in Europe. But the reason, the main reason I'm here is because God called me to come back and live in America. I didn't object greatly. I'm, I'm grateful. I really am. I got to live in this country for, I know I'm American. I get that. Don't they speak English very well for an American? Don't it? <laughs> but I'm, I'm proud to be an American. But even more than that, I'm proud to be a Christian. Because when all is said and done, remember, my first loyalty, my first citizenship is to Jesus and the kingdom of God. Secondarily, I'm grateful for the blessings we enjoy. I thank God for what we enjoy. And I want to do all I can to help the next generation to enjoy many of these same blessings. A liberal education used to mean presenting many options, discussing the merits, and finding the truth. Today, education in the public sector is more like brainwashing. You're all supposed to think and act and talk alike. That's not education. That's a shame. The rush towards socialism in America means we will lose our freedoms because the more government provides for us, the more government controls us. And that does mean loss of freedoms. I got a story to tell you. Years ago, I was invited every year to go to the state legislature and be the chaplain of the Senate. Some years I'd be chaplain of the Senate. Some years I was chaplain of the House. They had local pastors do that primarily. And so every year I get to go and spend a week or so being chaplain. I would open the session in prayer and talk with the legislators. And it was, it was a wonderful opportunity. Made lots of friends. Got to set up front with the with lieutenant governor and you know, all that stuff. And a special chair for the chaplain right up there. And it was fun to do. Several years ago, I prayed a prayer that was not politically correct. And I was banned. I'm no longer invited to speak or to address as the chaplain of the Senate or of the House. 
Would you like to know what I said that got me in trouble? Well, I always prayed in the name of Jesus. I said, if you want me to pray, I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus. That's the only God I know. I'm not going to pray to Almighty somebody who might be out there. So I always close my prayer in the name of Jesus. That's, you've got to know that going in. But here's what I said that got me banished forever from being the chaplain. Lord, help us to remember. It's so, I, I wrote it down, and I memorized it. And I still remember exactly word for word what I said. Lord, help us to remember that every law we pass takes away someone's freedom. Isn't that horrible? Isn't that common sense? I didn't think that was radical at all. And I was stunned that the chief clerk escorted me out. Yeah, for saying that. You're not supposed to address any legislation. I said, what are you talking about? I have no idea even, I'm not up to what's going on. I don't even know one piece of legislation. Her response, well, you came awfully close. Lord, help us to remember that every law we pass takes away someone's freedom. Isn't that amazing? It was buried in the prayer. It wasn't a big, it was just one line in about a minute and a half, 90 second prayer. Well, church, we have, we dare not give up. Our country has a Christian heritage. More laws mean less freedom. Always do. But our goal in America is not to establish a democracy, God forbid, or even a republic. Our goal is to use the freedoms we have and do all we can to maintain these freedoms so that we might promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I address these things because I think they're critically important. Don't give up on America. Samuel Adams had another great quote. Our contest is not only whether we ourselves shall be free, but whether there shall be left to mankind an asylum on earth for civil and religious liberty. Wow. That's why they founded America, for civil and religious liberty. Our buildings here, our church buildings across America, some are beautiful, some are not. But that's not what we're about. These are tools. We're not here to build buildings. We're not here to raise money to, to build monuments. <laughs> God spoke to me when, when I was first starting out. People would come and go. People would come to the church. and they go. There's always traffic. Every church. you got traffic going through. People come, people go. I say, God, people keep leaving the church. How come? They don't like me. And you know what? The Lord spoke very clearly. He said, I didn't call you here to build your empire, but my kingdom. Just because they left the place where you are the pastor doesn't mean they left the kingdom. Ooh. And we need to keep that in mind. We're here, first of all, as citizens of heaven to build the kingdom of God. We build buildings. We buy properties. We maintain them. But there's a much higher purpose, and that is the words of Jesus. Go into all the world and preach the good news to every creation. That's what we're about. All the stuff we've talked about is simply that we might have the freedom to carry out the Great Commission. To do what Jesus has called. Because all our buildings, and, and you know, I've been responsible for building a bunch of buildings and stuff. Someday they're going to all crumble. The most beautiful cathedrals, someday will all crumble. But the kingdom of Christ, of which I'm a member, will never fail. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We always have to keep that in view. Every time I return to American shores and see a flag, I kind of get a lump in my throat because I'm grateful for all that it represents. But I know that should Jesus tarry and America follows the pattern of nations of history, it's very probable, if Jesus doesn't come first, that America will disappear as the nation we have known in some way or other. We, we see it being chipped at constantly. And if that happens, it will be a shame. But my goal isn't just to preserve America. My goal is to proclaim the kingdom of God. That's our purpose. That's the higher goal. Because Jesus said in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. And that's what we're about. 
That's what we're about. My first citizenship is in heaven. My king is King Jesus, and his kingdom shall never fail. Remember the words of the Hallelujah chorus taken from the book of Revelation? And he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, that stirs my heart too. So don't give up. God still has his hand on America. I don't know how long it can endure, but I still believe in America. But more than that, I believe in God. Now, I know that almost always when I deliver a message like this about the confluence of America and our Christian faith, there are some who object. I get that. We're mixing faith and politics. I don't see it that way at all. We all live in a place called America. We are all influenced by political decisions, whether you like them or not. The values and laws of our nation affect our freedoms to worship and live out our faith. We either practice our faith within the laws of the land or we practice our faith contrary to the laws of the land. I would rather be able to practice our faith within the laws of the land. So I will battle for the laws of the land to allow me that freedom. Isn't that better than living contrary to the laws of the land? If you've ever met with the underground church, as I have in many countries, I'd rather be able to live within the laws. I don't want to become a religious criminal a religious criminal, and suffer persecution. So I say don't give up on America. There is a confluence, and I'm grateful. So our worship team is coming now, and uh, we've got a couple more really uh, important things. But I'd like for you just to stand briefly, and uh, I'm going to say a prayer and ask God's blessing. Would you stand, please? Lord Jesus, I am grateful First of all, and most of all, for you. For salvation, freely given, and for the opportunity to freely proclaim that message in this country. Lord, help us to keep our eyes always on King Jesus, always on King Jesus, that we might worship and glorify you in every way, every way possible. Lord, we pray for our nation again, that you would deliver us from evil, that you would give us a national revival where the churches are overflowing with people hungry for the truth of Jesus. People repentant of their sins, sorrowful for their wickedness, turning for forgiveness to you, Lord, with transformed lives, transformed hearts. Lord, I pray that you'll do your mighty work. Lord, send us a revival in this land. Send us a mighty revival. Raise up young men and women who will commit their lives to the proclamation of your truth, who will proclaim it here in America and around the world as we carry out the Great Commission. Lord, thank you for the privileges and opportunities. Help us, Lord, not to neglect them, to be passionate about our faith, wholeheartedly committed to your cause, the cause of freedom in Christ. Thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.